Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Oh, you know I'm welcoming you to Wow, What a Show. And here we are exalting the wonder of our Father through His Word. But even through the psalmist's words, we see are declaring His glory. Every day we are uh, taking uh, advantage, as it were, of those great things that the Lord has done and given us this beautiful world. And even though our world has many problems, the world is still a wonderful, beautiful place. And the canvas against which God has painted these uh, extremely wonderful views is just magnanimous because there it is, the firmament, right? The space, the air that God uses to show us what he has done. I just think it's amazing. And wow, what a show. Remember, I say to you, that show is the performance of God. He wrote the show, <laughs> he directs the show, and he produces the show. We are just those who partake in it. We're the characters, and he's also made us. So we are part of the wonder of what he has done here. The Lord is good. We have enjoyed reading through Proverbs, and enjoy is just one word, but we have greatly benefited also from reading through the book of Proverbs. It's like no other read that I ever did of Proverbs before. And I do believe it's because sometimes you just need to hear yourself say a thing. And so reading aloud has given us opportunity to hear it, to literally hear it. And hearing it makes us aware even more of um, what is being told us and how we need to check ourselves in these matters that are are the matters or the points made in the book of Proverbs. There are short sayings, right? Wisdom sayings. I call them sound bites because we're reading aloud. When you hear it, it's just a sound bite of <clears throat> our um, participation, as it were, in relationships. And this is where I think most of us would be ensnared. You know, if you could sit by yourself at home and, and just say, I love the Lord, then you're good to go. But if you can interact with others and still come out saying, I love the Lord and I love his people, <laughs> then you have achieved a beyond. And God is doing that in us because we are his church. We are the body of Christ. And not one person alone can ever make up the body of Christ. It takes the fullness of uh, those people that he has created the magnificence of the gifts that he has imparted to us. It takes our interacting with one another to first of all, be supplied ourselves. Fellowship is very important. And then to show the world the love of Christ. So we want to read today from chapter 29. Remember also we started in the month of July because there are 31 days in July and there are 31 days chapters in the book of Proverbs. And if you know the little song, 30 days had September, April, June, and November, all the rest have 31, except February that stands alone. That means that in any month with 31 days, you could choose to do this. I think January, excellent way to begin a new season in your life, a new year, and then July, because now it's every six months. However, you may choose May and I don't know, uh, December, whatever you choose, twice a year is good, but definitely once a year. We need to hear these uh, short sound bites. So here we go. Oh, I didn't tell you, by the way, I'm Phyllis, the host. And Wow, What a Show is the podcast outreach of Rehoboth Institute of the Arts. If you go to our site, these will be uploaded eventually, and you'll be able to actually go back and hear the reading of all of them. We've read twice a day, 9 a.m. and 8.30 most days, except Wednesday, we read 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And then we visit with uh, Pastor John Thomas in All Thy Getting, Get Understanding. 
Proverbs 4, 7, the quote that he's authored these booklets, their Bible studies, and he is, you know, encouraging us and exhorting us to live with the understanding that is given us in God's word, not just cursory reads, but time spent with the Lord so that he can open it up to us. And then um, we will be finished with Proverbs Sunday at two o'clock. We read on Sundays at two. We started twice a day and then I cut it back because of church. So by the grace of God, we will culminate and hopefully that with some good, good words from a dear friend who's had an encounter with God concerning Proverbs. So I want you to be here if you can at all come by the grace of God. And I'll thank you very much for doing so. Okay, with this, we're going to read now um, from Proverbs chapter 29. Father, as we read, I ask that you would open our ears to hear your word and cause us, Lord, to walk in your way. Make us those people who self-examine so that we know, Father, where we are lacking and what things we need to uh, allow you to move into and to change. We need you, Father. We need you. And we want you. We want to have good fellowship with you because you have promised us eternal life. And who doesn't want it? By the grace of God, who does not want eternal life? We all do. And so, Father, we thank you for uh, walking with us, helping us, giving us uh, the way. I love it. Thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Very good. Good morning to all of you who are here. So good that you've come. Thank you very much. We're going to read now Proverbs 29. Verse 1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Good morning. Oh, I have some faithfuls in the in the studio audience. Thank you so much. Uh, Fresh and spaces, light, touch. I love it. Thank you for being here. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I do. I'm not gonna go through it all. I'm gonna read them all, but I'm not gonna expound them all. But I'm gonna start with uh, Proverbs 29. And as I was reading uh, before we came on this morning to kind of get real familiar myself with what is going on here. It is important, I think, for us to look at Proverbs um, 29, verse 1, and remember what the Lord told Moses about Pharaoh. The Lord said that he would harden his heart and he wouldn't let his people go. Now, people say, how, you know, that, that the Lord did that. He, he is the reason. But this is the proverb, to me, explains it. Pharaoh was the king. And he really believed that he had the power to keep those Israelites from going out, to not allow that to happen because the, the Israelites were very, very uh, useful for the, the uh, Egyptians. They had been enslaved there and they were building stuff. You, if you read the story, you'll know they were making bricks and building all this wonderful stuff that we now give Egypt all this credit for, right? And of course, it was in their heart to do it, but it was the Jewish people who were doing it at that time. And the Lord wanted to deliver them out of that bondage. The bondage had been predetermined, by the way. The Lord told Jacob that his seed would be in bondage for 400 years. And truly, as God's truth always comes to light, they were in Egypt first, not, not in bondage. Remember, Joseph went in there delivered his family from famine, and Joseph had favor at that time with the ruler. But then the uh, the Israelites came in, he welcomed them in, the Pharaoh at that time, or the king, whatever he was called, and the, the Israelis prospered, and they grew, and they multiplied. And then the Egyptians saw their strength, saw them prospering, and said, oh no, you know, like people do, uh, they start hating the ethnicities that are not them. They think they own the land. Well, God owns the land. Trust me when I tell you. So they put them in enslavement. They enslaved them. They put them under their thumb, as it were. 
And the people cried out and the Lord already, he knew, he had already told Jacob that this is what was going to happen. And he then delivered them. And we know the story of Moses being preserved. He was more, he was Jewish. He was preserved at the court of the, of the uh, Pharaoh. And then God called him out. So when God called him out, you know, got him ready to go back to the Pharaoh. At some point he said, he, it, I will harden his heart. What he was really saying is his heart is hardened. And he will not let them go. But I'm going to, before before I do what I'm going to do to Pharaoh, I'm going to give him how many times did Moses go back and go back and go back. And God showed Pharaoh his miraculous power. And Pharaoh still wouldn't let the people go. He that being often reproved hardens his neck. And he shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. And what did the Lord do after Pharaoh wouldn't let them go, wouldn't let them go? Hey, God just really took his firstborn because he had sent a plague against them and God sent one right back to him. So he then let him, let him go. And the whole army in pursuit, even after he let him go, he said, get out, right? Go. He sent his army after them. And after they, they fled, the Lord opened that sea and the Israelites walked through on dry ground, so the Bible says. And when the army of Pharaoh came in after him, he allowed those rushing waters to just drown them right there. Hardening your heart, hardening your neck, as it is written here, is not a good idea with God. Because suddenly destruction will come and there is no remedy to that destruction. This is a message that we all should hear. If you're a person who attends a church and you have a, a, a pastor who is teaching and a pastor who is admonishing and trying very hard to teach the word of God and to bring us into obedience, and you go and you just let it roll off of your uh, back or your brain or whatever it is is rolling off of, you absolutely ignore it. You walk out the same way you came in Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, but you think you're in salvation. I am here to warn you that is not so. If you're not changing in the inner man, if you're not becoming more like Jesus, the very word that is preached, if it's a full word of God, then you have to go back. To the, to the beginning, you got to go to the drawing board and say, Father, help me here. Because you see, disobedience has its reward. Thank you, Fresh and Pharaoh is. And that's what the Lord just showed me this morning. So I'll continue to read. Verse 2 says, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man beareth rule, the people sigh. We know that when that has been already um unfolded for us in Proverbs 28. And then I think there is another, uh, when the when the uh, righteous rule, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, they, uh, they cry out or they are something like that. But we've gone through that one. And verse three says, whosoever loves wisdom rejoices his father, but he that keeps company with harlots wastes his substance. Isn't it something that the contrast here between a person who would love wisdom and a person who uh, loves or keeps company with harlots. That's the contrast. It seems an unlikely contrast. But the wise heart, as we learned in probably the first 10, 11, 12 chapters, the wise man does not allow the harlotry of women to bring them under their foot. Now, another great example is Samson. Samson was born and anointed. He was anointed before he was even conceived. The Lord told his mother that he would be a, um, what do you call him? Ah, sorry. Anyway, he was supposed to be holy and set apart. I can't remember what it is called. Somebody help me out there. He was going to be a Levite, not a Levite. What was, the, what was Samson? Anyway, he was a judge of Israel, right? But he was uh, the kind of judge and, and holy person who would not cut their hair, they wouldn't eat 
uh, strong, they drink strong drink, and they didn't eat uh, certain things. So their lives were set apart. And um, the set apart, good morning, a Nazarite. Thank you, Freshen. I tell you, you're good. Good morning, teeny, teeny. Uh, so, but Samson, after his mother told him what to do and, you know, all this stuff, he still did what he wanted to do. He was strong. And we know the story of Samson and Delilah. Every filmmaker that had the money to do it, I'm sure, has made that story. We've seen Samson and Delilah, I think, in cartoon form. I'm not quite sure. But he was a Nazarite, and he was not supposed to be dealing the way he was. Okay, so his mom told him over and over again and kept trying to take a wife from outside of his own um, a country, his own uh, ethnic ethnic group. He was, he was a Jewish man. He was an Israelite. He goes and falls in love with Delilah. <clears throat> and Delilah was working on behalf of the, um, what was, uh, Goliath was one of those people. Ooh, my brain is not functioning. <laughs> and I walked this morning, so I got plenty of blood flowing to it. But nonetheless, he takes his woman. And she's a, of a, a harlot sort. The Philistines, fresh and you are there for me today. Absolutely. He takes Delilah of the Philistines and the Philistines were against Israel and they wanted to destroy them. He goes and hooks up with Delilah, who I don't know why Samson was so dull because she kept asking him, where is your strength? Where does your strength lie? Where does your strength lie? And Samson, in his lack of understanding, really thought it was in his hair. And she wheeled it out of him and she cut his hair and he did go weak. But the weakness didn't come because she cut his hair. The weakness came because he was in disobedience. We go right back to verse one. If you harden your hearts against truth, if you continue to do what you want to do, live like you want to live, there is a recompense. There is a reward and it is sudden destruction. And unfortunately, Samson did repent. His hair did grow back and he did deliver Israel but he did it with his life. We have to listen to God's word and listen, submit, just be in obedience. It's just a better thing. And by the way, we are happier campers when we follow the Lord. The king by justice establishes the land, but he that exacteth gifts, gifts overthrows it. Sometimes I think that in America, we shall be consumed by taxes. <laughs> I live in a very high tax district. I'm telling you, the taxes uh, that we have to pay as homeowners in this county are so high that I could put a down payment on another house somewhere else and 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 live better. And honestly, I'm praying about it. But, you know, once you get into a house, it's hard to kind of get out of the house. You know, it, it takes more than just. And, and by the way, the mortgage you're paying, those taxes are all included. But it makes it very difficult to um, to be able to afford anything other than, you know, the necessities of life. And I don't like that at all because I like to help others. So I'm asking the Lord to help me. I get through all of this. So this exacting of uh, stuff from the from the uh, poor, and I am poor, by the way. Okay, so the uh, he that exacts gifts overthrows it. Now I think in this one too, though, those the exacting of gifts that is having people pay you. Um, you know, you 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 pay for then you get paid for favors, right? So that is another thing that is not. A really, really good. Oh, so I'm mean, looking at the commentary, right? And this guy says excessive taxation has usually been the primary cause of even uh, every fallen government in the history of the world. Isn't that something? So we are like in in the oh my, we're we're really in a in a bad place here. We need to really begin to speak out about all these taxes. But we have a big government, and our government gives back to the people. So some of it I understand. However, I don't understand how high they can be. Um, but but also bribery and, and letting be you know the, the government being paid favors like uh, what is it? we call them um, groups that advocate for certain certain laws or certain uh, um, donations etc like that and and they they donate to the candidates 
and then the candidates get in there and they try to make it come come to pass for them. That is wrong and that will destroy the nation. A man flatters his neighbors, spreadeth a nest nest for his steps. That's verse five. A man that flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his steps. That flattery is not good. And we've talked about this earlier. Flattery leads people, the weak of mind, of course, uh, to to believe what has been uh, said. Social interest says Frasian, yes. And lobbyists, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Lobbyists, that's right. Those lobbyists, those people who get up there and they have the money and organizations to get on Capitol Hill and, you know, meet with those um, lawmakers and the senators and the congressmen and they paying them to do what they do. All righty. So let me move forward. Um, verse six says, oh, no, verse five, we, Amanda flatters his neighbor. Okay, so this one is just about flattery. You should always be suspicious of flattery. Mother used to tell us, do not allow flattery to determine what you will say, how you will walk, what you will do. Ignore the flattering tongue because it is an ensnarement for sure. And people who flatter a lot usually I, listen, you can't you can't trust it. They're not always deceitful, but sometimes their flattery is mockery. Um, yes, special interest group, groups are prevalent. They, they, yeah, they have been for a long time because we have that freedom in this country to do that, uh, to you know, to lobby, to go out, to say whatever, to protest this sort of thing. But it is incumbent upon those people who make our laws and who are providing governance for the nation to deny that. They should not take those. Uh, almost it's a bribe. Okay, so verse 7 says, the righteous taketh knowledge of the cause of the poor. The wicked hath not understanding to know it. That's right. Righteous people, heart of God, concerned for the poor. And we do that not just to give people stuff. It isn't that you go out and you know give away your food, you give away your clothes, you give away your money. It is to evangelize and let people know that God cares. And so we need to do it with God's wisdom and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I have witnessed many big feeding programs through churches and they just pass out food, but they never give out the bread of life. And it's the bread of life that will keep a man from hungering. And so we need to do better, I believe, by that. You know, one person starts to do something, then the whole world starts doing it. It's crazy. God has more creative uh, creative ways to reach people than that. And I'm not saying don't give out food. I'm saying but if you're not giving out the word of God as well, if you're not demonstrating and being a witness for Christ Jesus, if you're not trying to draw the people with the word, you know, and, and I'm listening, don't, you don't have to stand up and read the Bible though in some places you could do that. But our very conversation can be the word of God and people will, by the anointing that is there, they will sense who you are and recognize God. And some may come, excuse me, to want to know the Lord. We've got to give them more than that. So softer scoffers set a city in a flame but wise men turn away wrath we've talked about this too when you have a lot of unscrupulous men who are kindling up strife in any place then you you got a city on fire really and truly take that even into your own home you got a home on fire you have a community on fire people who are scoffers remember the scoffer is a fool and when they are in multiplied number, <laughs> they have great impact. However, their influence and impact is not greater than God's. And where we have a, a recognition of that, let God's people be of one mind and one heart and unite. And we could be overcomers. Okay. Uh, it is not wise or 
if a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, whether he be angry or laugh, there will be no rest. We've talked about this for many chapters in Proverbs. You know, the foolish man, you just can't even help them out, really. You try to help them, they won't be helped. So they go their own way and the Lord is meeting them at their end because the end comes. Verse 10 says, the bloodthirsty hate him that is perfect. And as for the upright, they seek his life. Hey, you got it. This is it. How many good people, people who've done something that is uh, for the good of many, how many of them have been slaughtered or killed unnecessarily? I think of Navalny in, uh, I think his name is Navalny in Russia. He's in protest against the ills of the government. He's been poisoned three times by that government three times and God has seen fit to preserve this man's life and we pray father help the man because he is not he's not um you know evil against the government he's simply uh, working to bring relief to the nation's people and the lord the poverty there the lack there he's i think he's trying to lobby for democracy and of course that government you know is not democratic of um, so a fool utters his anger. I love this one. Verse eleven is the one I said I was going to talk about. Verse eleven: A fool utters his all his anger, all his anger, but a wise man keeps it back and uh, steals it. It steals. This is about ref- you know you get mad right, and you just want to like blah 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 blah. blah. I was that person. You just you just you just mad, and you just say whatever you want to say, but to to hold back a moment and reconsider, to let people say whatever they want to say and you just stop in your tracks before you answer, that is wisdom. And by the way, when we really examine what was going on, you may find, I have found many times, it's not even worth the energy of my anger, right? I can keep a lot of strife and and stress off myself If I just calm down and wait, this is a good thing. And uh, I want you to do uh, consider that. Yes, Lord, (laughs) most times we have to walk away from fools and not be drawn into their drama. It's what they love. It is what they love. And sometimes people have been so traumatized and hurt that they are trying to hurt other people to kind of appease or alleviate their own pain. It does not achieve that. In fact, it increases their pain. But that is what is going on sometimes. Verse 12, if a ruler hearkeneth to falsehood, all his servants are wicked. Now that's amazing, right? Um, the, The idea here is that when a ruler is willing to listen to lies, then those lies could be about people who work with him. But the lie doesn't have to be the truth. So it is the habit, if it's the habit of that ruler to just listen to the lie, he will then be the kind of person who might punish otherwise. Also, that infection and his need for that to be fed stuff infects the group and they will lie to him, you see, to keep him happy. I think we just saw something like that in our presidency. But let me tell you, uh, it's not good. When a ruler rules like that, if if a king or any other man in authority can be moved by false reports and he heeds them, then those reports will be lodged against any servant and by any evil man who seeks to replace him. See? See? If he believes the falsehoods, he will soon have no confidence in anybody on his staff. And we've seen in history kings who went through this and they were always thinking that somebody was going to kill him. Somebody was going to kill him. Somebody was going to overthrow him. Somebody, and they started killing <laughs> and they killed innocent folks because of that. These are really good. Lies can spread like wildfire. And a lot of people believe the lies absolutely like touch. I'm telling you, we have experienced that in these last um, three years that we've been under this COVID uh, watch. 
It's amazing. So verse 13 says, the poor man and the oppressor meet together, but Jehovah lighteneth the eyes of them both. So those who think that they are better than someone else, be it because of their particular ethnic uh, background or their, their uh, genealogy or their money or their station in life. This proverb for the second time, we've come to this. God made both, both people and he allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. The Lord God let seed time and harvest meet us all. So your table is supplied and so is mine. So we don't have the right to think like that. Verse 14, the king that faithfully judges the poor, his strong shall be established forever. And that was King David. <clears throat> and the Lord has established David's throne forever. It continues in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's lineage goes back to King David and then back to Abraham. And of course, Abraham goes back to God himself. Jesus Christ establishing the throne of David. And the Lord promised David that it would be that way. He was a good king. Verse 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself causes shame to his mother. All I say about this one is I'm saying, go to school with your children and see what's going on. Understand what a teacher goes through. Not every teacher is good, but there are many who really do want to teach. But an unruly child will not only not himself be taught, but his unruliness will keep other children from being taught. Just go to school, spend a day there watching these little unruly children, and then you'll go home and be a much better disciplinarian and, and for your own children. And that's the real truth. I learned the hard way. When the wicked are increased, transgression increases, but the righteous shall look upon their fall. Once again, we've been through it way back in Proverbs 11. And then again in Proverbs 29, and verse, uh, this, 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 this uh, principle is real. When the wicked increase, transgression, well, it makes sense, doesn't it? LOL, unruly children. That's right, Light Touch. They are beautiful. They are so unruly. Oh, and Light Touch has been there. She was with them at age, what, three or something? Um, and and she can tell you stories. I can tell you stories too. Uh, but the, the, I, but I, didn't, I didn't meet the stories until like they hit fifth grade, sixth grade. And then it, it wasn't that bad. But honey, when you get to eighth grade, good gracious. Seventh, oh, seventh grade. Seventh grade would take your head off your shoulders. You know what I mean? Those children can be so amazing. Three and four years old. And some of these little ones coming to school already cussing and carrying on. Now you don't put that on the child. Eleven, two, says, <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> just spend a day at school and choose whatever level you want to. You will experience what unruly children are like. And because the teacher has very little power. There are ways that you can do it, you know, and sometimes really an unruly child really is the one who, who's not, he's not prone to sitting there lecturing. <clears throat> I don't, be, I, I would never send a child to the principal right away before I tried many ways to, um, you know, to teach them. But when you can't do it, you just can't do it. Oh my goodness, you go, Lord, I can't handle this. And I taught movement. So it wasn't that I had them in a chair, you know, lecturing to them. That my my class was really one where many learning styles would were satisfied just in the process, but uh, some of the kids just were off the charts. I can't even tell you. And there are so many parents you call them, and they think their child is the best thing since sliced bread, and you cannot talk to them. I had that experience, and when that mama came at me, I said, "Well, I thought you wanted to know, and so I've called you." And I just want you to know hitherto that he will not be able to stand in this class because I cannot teach the rest of the children. And that is really unfair. That mom calmed right down and started acting like she was a, a human being. But before that, she was going to get me told and, and all that. You teachers, you teachers. And I'm saying, well, that's true. I am a teacher. But um, and I know that there are some stuff that teachers do that are, you know, hurts the parents heart. But in this case, I, I'm, I'm calling to talk with you. I didn't call to tell you negative stuff. I want to understand how to deal with this child. 
by the way, you are invited to come and deal with them yourself. You can sit in my class. You know what I mean? But anyway, that will help you to be a better parent. So correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will be a delight to your soul. That's the ultimate goal right there. Correction. And listen, I I, I want to get off the little ones. I love little children. I enjoy teaching. I had the best fun in my life. But when those little ones come in there and they're hurt and in pain and whatever's going on at home or around them, maybe they're being bullied. Teachers have a, a responsibility to find out. They have a responsibility, I believe, to love that child. And part of loving the child is getting with the parents. Me too. Love children, right? They're so much fun. Little ones are amazing. <laughs> but uh, it'll help us to be better parents who really understand how they act when they're not at home. And my oldest sister said that, you know, she had one one daughter and she was crazy about that little daughter. She was. And this this sister raised their her children by Dr. Spark. OK, you didn't. They didn't get punished for much at all. And she accompanied this child on a trip at school. She was a, a chaperone on a bus trip. And when she saw her child acting out, she said she was in shock, total shock. You see? And 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 what you're doing at home, you're trying to raise them to the right, but you you know you're giving into them a lot, you're pampering and all that. So it 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 changes what the, what the child will be like at school. Where there is no vi- vision, the people cast off restraint. But he that keeps the law, he's happy. Now Anna Kane did the best job on this, and I'm not going to even try it. What I'm saying though, um, the vision vision is what do you want. Um, what do you see in front of you as a as a model for how a, a group of people will come will come together, right? Um, <laughs> neither um, that vision will inform how you establish the necessities and of the interaction, the social uh, boundaries, etc. And remember, Anna, I love that when she said uh, the laws, the translation of, of, of one of the proverbs she gave was for positive law. Law, God's law does not denigrate and downplay and show favoritism. Give equity and justice. And there's a third one in there. You can see, I, I think I got too much blood in my brain this morning. It's very hard for me to talk. But what does the Lord require of thee but to do justice, right? To show equity and to be loving, really, it's it's Christ. Um, And if you don't have a good vision, and really and truly, the people cast off restraint. They go, wow, that's what happens in a classroom. I always see the classroom is a little model of the world. It's a cosmos there. You've got the representation of all kinds of little folks or big folks, right? And if you do not set those boundaries quick, like in a real hurry, the teacher loses absolute control. And that's when teachers are let go. When a teacher cannot discipline their classroom, they lose their jobs. And so many teachers fail they don't understand it. They love the kids. So they walk in cold turkey and these children would take exact, they would just, they would just take advantage. Honey, when I learned that, let me tell you, I went in my class when the bell sounded, I had to learn it though, because I didn't start that way. And I was losing ground quick, like in a hurry. And then I sat down and talked to my, to my oldest sister, who's a teacher's teacher. She is the quintessential teacher. And she gave me, uh, a, a, you know, a plan, a, a lesson plan template and talked to me about discipline. So when the bell would ring, straight away, turn right around. Don't stand at the door and talk to anybody. Go right to that class. And when I, I had a big old sign, so when you enter this place, take your shoes off. All the process, I gave it to the children paper and I went over it with them. And when they started chatting and I started to talk, I had a whistle in my hand. I blew that whistle as loud as hard as I could. Yeah, it stung their little ears and they would call, they would cover their ears and say, Miss Ledbetter, Miss Ledbetter. And I'm saying, well, I'm trying to speak and you, you're you not listening. So I thought you couldn't hear me. 
And then if while I was teaching and, and, and somebody started talking, I would begin to speak French. I just speak in French, whether it was right French or wrong French, it wouldn't even matter. And they say, what are you saying? And I'm saying, uh, and I would say this in French, uh, you're not listening. So I thought I was speaking the wrong language. And then I would translate it, right? And they would get a little chuckle. But honey, I I had to be rope tied on it too because I had all kinds of children in one class and it was a movement class. So can you imagine the chaos that would have been going on? And I taught in the gym and they wanted to play basketball. I had to get control. And that's what this is saying here. Um, uh, by the way, where there's no vision, See, the people cast off his strength, but he that keeps the law is happy. Mother used to tell us, you, you give ch children boundaries and they're happier in that. And it's the real truth. When you, folks don't know what to do and how to do it, they'll do whatever it comes to mind and heart. And that little enemy called the devil is right there to push the screw in so that everything is in chaos. We have to take these proverbs very serious. And the next proverb is like unto it. A servant will not be corrected by words. For though he understand, he will not give heed. That servant mentioned here is a slave whose obedience is reluctant. And you can understand why it is, but uh, such a person would deliberately refuse to pro be properly instructed. Now, the slavery that they're talking about is not the slavery that we experience as black people in this very dastardly uh, slavery that our uh, our ancestors had to um, endure. It wasn't a slavery of evil. That's the slavery of the American, uh, uh, African-American. This was a slavery like employment. You know, uh, the Lord had a had guidelines. People didn't enslave and beat and carry on. Well, maybe that was a little of that going on with the Israelites. Maybe, I don't know. But um, in general, the slavery we endured is not the slavery that was talked about uh, in, in the ancient days. My husband is from a country where they always had servants. You know, the poor people have you got servants. They're not running around treating them like dogs like that. Right. So when you are in employment, you must do what you are, you know, what's been laid out for you to do. And if you won't be corrected by words, I come and tell you the wrong thing that you're doing wrong, then, um, you know, you might lose your job. <laughs> and even though he understands, he said, you can't tell me what to do. People say that stuff. And and I'm saying, well, no, I can't. Uh, well, well, yes, I can. I can. Because this is your job and this is your job description. And uh, you don't have to do it. Now, that part is true. But I want you to know if you don't do it, you're going to have to answer somebody more than me. I'm just a little OP on here. You are going to lose this job. Right. And it never fails. That's how it goes. So uh, verse 20 says, See thou a man that is hasty in his words. There is more hope of that fool. <laughs> more hope for a fool than for him. Hasty in your words absolutely makes you a foolish person. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there, Yes, there was. Me too, love children. Absolutely. I don't know what that means, uh, fresh, and you have to bring me up to date. So uh, but yeah, you know, don't be hasty in, in your words. We talked about this. Um, refrain from just speaking what you want to say any old time. Because listen, we're not that smart, nor are we uh, that that um, right. You know, we're not always right. And you just speak hastily. Just come back every time. Somebody say something, you're just coming back, coming back, coming back. I'm saying, you know, lighten it up a little bit. Just take a little moment to listen and don't enter into the realm of the foolish. Just don't go there. Listen and learn. That's the one thing I learned from my husband. I got a husband that can just sit and listen to you. He can just listen. And honest to goodness, he will only respond if you actually move over into his territory, then start talking about him. He might he might respond then, but he can listen. And I used to really watch him and say, "Wow, he's so comfortable with himself," because I chatter on out of nervousness, you know. But I, I learned that from Tad. So now I can sit and listen too, and people can say all stuff, and they just trying to, you know, they think they know you very well, and so they're telling you what you ought to do and how you need to do it and whatever. And I was one of those people a little bit, I guess. I don't know. But I and I think while they're talking, well, mm, they only knew me. 
you know, I, but I just say, let them go on because they will, if we are in association for long, they will know me. And then, you know, maybe they'll change their mind about it. So, okay. He that delicately brings up a servant from a child shall have him become a son at the last. Now, the commentary, I went to the commentary to see about this one. They don't really know what this is meaning, but it seems straightforward to me. If you have a servant or somebody working in your home, right, and they've been with you since a child, and that relationship has developed, why would he not be a son? I mean, after all, you spend all that time when you got to be a hard hearted person not to eventually really understand and take this person um, as, a, as a child of your own, or at least close enough to share in some of the beauty of a parent-child relationship. That's my take on it. Welcome, Sheila. Um, we are in Proverbs chapter 29 today. We're excited. And we are already at verse 21. We're going to verse 22. An angry man stirs up strife, and a wrathful man abounds in transgression. Remember, ladies, I told you we're finally being um, <laughs> on the other end of this wisdom stick. <laughs> so we've been talking about contentious women, right? Being like rain that never stops dripping. Well, here we have this angry man. And we met this again back in Proverbs 15 and Proverbs 22. Someone who is angry. And I suppose a man could be a generic term as all of these uh, Proverbs relate both to the male and the female. But people who stir up strife, they do it on purpose. Really and truly, they are wrathful and they do abound in sins, transgressions. It's a, it's a transgression is a, a, a breach between you and the righteous way. Yeah, you know, if you're the kind of person who do you talk too much and you're always saying this and that, and you see that it leads to disagreement, division, you know, anger between others because of your words, ask God for forgiveness and back it up, please. Verse 23 says, a man's pride shall bring him low, but he that is of a lowly spirit shall obtain honor. Right away, pride goeth before a fall. He that exalts himself, who that humbles himself under the mighty hand of God shall be exalted in due season. This is, this is, this is New Testament, New Covenant working here being uh, forestated in these wisdom sayings. So we know that Solomon was gifted by God in these wise sayings. And we know that these things are for us all because this is already, again, a part of our Christian understanding. Verse 24, whoso is partner with a thief hates his own soul. He heareth that the adjuration and uttereth nothing. So I don't know if you know the, the TV series, Father Brown. Well, one of the characters in Father Brown, Father Brown is a sleuth, he's a, he's a priest, but he likes Ways of mind to to uh, you know search things out. He's good in, de in detective skills, and so he's a pain in the in the detective's tushy, you know there. But he has a he's met this man who is a professional thief, and the guy really likes Father Brown, so he always comes to visit him. You know when he's going to steal something in his vicinity, and Father Brown never ever um, takes part in his thievery. He gives, he's witnessing to him and he will turn him in. And the guy knows this, but he likes Father, Father Brown and he's very clever. So he always finds a way out. And this is what the, 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 the quintessential essence, Father Brown is witnessing to him, wanting to take him in, likes him, will give him a meal or whatever, but he's never his partner and he will never cover his misdeeds because there is a reward for partaking in 
the misdeeds of criminals, or rather taking part in the sins of others. We don't want to go there. All righty. Not only that, if you have to go to court, you might perjure yourself, right? You, you, you can't do that. So the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever puts his trust in Jehovah shall be safe. There you go. That's just it. That's a flip-flop. Fear of man, and pe many people fear men. But if we put our trust in the Lord, if we fear the Lord, he has promised safety. Verse 26, many seek the ruler's favor, but a man's judgment comes from Jehovah. So seeking the favor of rulers, you know, for whatever purpose um, might put you in the presence of a ruler, but only the Lord will give you justice. All, all, um, you know, everything in the world is flawed. And so you might think that you are saved from something by getting the favor of others. But eventually, if you are a transgressor, see, God ultimately is the one who provides the justice. So no matter what you think you're accomplishing by, you know, I don't know, cozying up with people that you think have power, you're going to be sadly mistaken because justice is from God. Verse 27 says, an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, but he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. And there it is. That's right. We already heard up there that, you know, a, a, a righteous man is hated and his life is sought. So to the wicked, absolutely you are going to be an abomination. But on the flip of that, an unjust man is also an abomination to the righteous. However, the righteous will not seek to hate him or, 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 or destroy him. The righteous, if you are righteous and you have the heart of the Lord, you'll be, you, you, you will go to, to the Lord on your knees on behalf of those who are in the way of sin. Because we know that sin breeds death. And death is eternity. It, 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 it's not just you close your eyes and go to sleep according to the biblical description. It's more than that. It's an eternity, eternity in the absence of God. It's an eternity in hell. And nobody wants that to happen to anyone. So guys, here we are at the end. You know, the Lord has been so very faithful. And I was talking this morning to a friend who has difficulty getting in, but she's been in on some of these. <clears throat> and she has said almost daily how the reading of Proverbs has just improved um, understanding and helped her uh, to look in inwardly as it has me. And that the Lord has appointed our readers and those who've given comment in such a way as to really be very gentle, very kind, but very, very good in the exposition. We've had a wonderful read through. And I thank God that we are in the, the final days. This is chapter 29. We have two days left in, in the calendar month. And so, God willing, we meet this evening at, at um, 8.30 again for the reading of chapter 29. Tomorrow we shall read chapters, uh, chapter 30, 9 a.m. and 8.30 p.m. And Sunday, we're going to have the dessert, uh, 2 o'clock. <laughs> we will read chapter 31. It's been so good. I so appreciate those of you who have come and I ask you to share it with some others, you know, uh, because sometimes it's like you're pouring water in the sea. Even though we are benefiting, there are others who could indeed benefit. So uh, share it and, and bring someone in by the grace of God. I appreciate you coming and I pray that your day is a good one. Whatever time of day it is for you, there is still the declaration of God's glory or the showing forth of his handiwork or the speaking forth of knowledge. His law is still alive and well and applicable wherever we are. 
and the wisdom of God helps us to apply the knowledge of God in the context of our lives. That's what makes the universality of God's word. And this is the very miracle that we find in it. It is a word that can be applied and used wherever you are, whatever your culture, whatever your circumstance, whatever events come to pass. God is on our side. I love the Lord, says Psalm 116, because he hath inclined his ear unto me, because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. Oh God, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness. Father, plant this wisdom in us. Lord God, allow it to take root as you have already tilled the soil, that we may grow, Lord God, and become trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. I love it. May God bless you. Thank you so much, every one of you who've been here. You are a real um, delight to my time <laughs> on the podcast. I so appreciate you. Now, as the trees of the field go out and clap their hands, we shall do the same, rejoicing that the Lord has set for us a worthy table. I tell you, nobody does it quite like he does it. God bless you, everyone. And I'll see you maybe, if you can, again this evening. If not, tell someone. And let me tell you guys, I don't tell you to tell someone because I need an audience. I don't. I can talk about Jesus through a signpost. I love doing it. But we are here that others may know him. And it occurred to me while I was reading the Proverbs that there are many people who don't read the Bible. They would be uh, amazed at what the Lord has to say about our everyday, all day existence. He cares. He's near. And he wants us in his kingdom. Have a wonderful day. Oh, Light Touch says, Glory and honor be unto our God who has blessed us in the Proverbs. Amen. All day blessings to everyone. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank all of you who like the show. That improves my level. Love you much. Take care. Take care. <laughs>